Hello. Um, hello. So, uh, sorry, this is late. Uh, Monday, having Monday off kind of threw me off a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Tuesday, I'm really, really busy with my anatomy and physiology classes, which is why I couldn't really record until I hit today. And I wanted to try something new today. Uh, not only recording with my best buddy, Monty here. Say hi, Monty. Monty's like, I guess. Anyway, and um, on top of that, um, I wanted to try recording through Zoom so that way you could see my face on top of listening to me talk about the notes. So what I'm planning on doing on Monday and next week is I'm planning on um, putting up a Zoom link. So that way, if you wanna join me live, you more certainly can. So where you'd see a, uh, you know, the uh, collaborate link, there will instead be a Zoom link next week. And so that way I can record, people can come in. And um, on top of that, then I can turn it into a video and upload it to uh, YouTube and edit it from there and then post it again. So I think that might work a little bit better. Um, so you can see my face and hopefully understand when I'm making jokes <laughs> while I'm teaching. Um, also, I'd like to point out, I read and replied to all of your introductory posts in the discussion boards. That was really cool. I learned so much about you. Uh, like uh, some of you know knife throwing, some of you are learning different languages. Some of you have definitely gotten to go to a whole bunch of different countries I wish I could go to. Um, um, some of you going into, uh, two of you look like you're like going into zoology or planners on it. One's definitely hopefully going into vet teching. Um, I was really interested in the uh, nuclear engineering because I do love talking about um, nuclear fun on uh, biology stuff. So we'll probably hit that in the future. And, you know, one of you is taking this for fun, which is really cool. So yes, it took me a bit because there's 25 of you in here. So, hi. Anyway, um, so let's go ahead and start talking about evolution. So as well, as we left off, we were talking about Dear Darwin and him getting, um, influenced by uh geology thoughts at the time and it's kind of funny because he poor guy he was he was so riddled with so many illnesses that never got diagnosed and we'll talk about in just well, actually let's go ahead and start talking about it right now this is not going to let me go next there we go. So anyway, um, I, I mentioned last week that we had a famous uh, in his journal. Uh, it says right here, even the most famous scientists had a couple of a rough couple of weeks, except for Darwin. It was it was constant. He was always getting ill. His health was actually pretty bad, um, which is sad. Uh, but also came from the fact that uh, he was kind of inbred. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean he was put in a loaf of bread. Um, his own wife, this is his wife, Emma, right here. Isn't she nice? Um, they were both first cousins. In other words, yes, they both had the same grandfather. And her family and his, I mean, her, her family, the Darwins and her family um, were very much intertwined. Um, his mother was actually also out of emma's family so yeah and he knew this too he actually did research on his own family after he published his origin of species so but yeah he actually wrote in his journal and here's a picture of it i am very poorly today i'm very stupid and hate everybody and everything and it's understandable the man had a lot of diseases he was not in a good way um but nobody could diagnose him at the time it was probably because his family was so inbred that he was that way he even noticed it in his own offspring him and his wife emma they had 10 kids could you imagine in that day and age 10 kids la what do you think bunty he's like i don't know i'm a virgin it's true anyway um 
so yeah uh three uh seven of them survived to adulthood which is also pretty intense and although three of them could not have their own kids later on so again yeah he and he knew it too he actually wrote down that they weren't very robust which is kind of funny it's like yeah we'll write that about your own kids in a book they aren't my kids aren't very robust it's like oof oof anyway so yeah darwin had bouts of depression and not very good health and it's amazing he came out as well as he did so hmm so speaking of when he published his volume which is the origin of species which was yay freaking thick i mean i'm not kidding you you could probably beat somebody to heck with that book if you wanted to or read it to them and make them go oh because he had he was meticulous in picking up information and writing it down and drawing everything and he was really amazing at that so yeah monty's holding onto my arm right now you got a thought about that no okay anyway so he was really meticulous but basically it boils down to he was proposing the then theory of natural selection and it was kind of based on um some new geology thoughts at the time and his own observations that were insanely critical of what he was watching so there's four parts to uh darwin's uh grand idea of natural selection and it's relatively simple and very much often misunderstood. But let's imagine, for instance, a population of beetles. And we've got green beetles and brown beetles. And they're very uh, equal in the species. Um, you know, there doesn't seem to be any uh, selection either way. So, yeah, one, okay. So anyway, so there's variation in traits. So some are green, some are brown. However, this is differential reproduction. In other words, the environment can't support unlimited population growth. Not all uh, individuals get to reproduce uh, to their full potential. In other words, say for whatever reason, they're in an area where there's a lot of brown colored foliage or more, you know, dirt or open spaces and not a lot of green. And bugs, uh, uh, unfortunately, that makes the brown beetles able to blend in with their surroundings easier. So they actually can hide better from predators like birds whereas the green uh beetles would be selected against because what's happening is the uh, birds can see the greens really well and go mm, greens and then pick it up and eat it so that's what you got going on with that uh is that because the greens are being picked off and eaten before they can reproduce and have more little green beetle bud babies um there's not a lot of the genes that make green getting uh passed on to the next generation whereas the brown beetles are hiding better and um because of this they don't get eaten as much they can have more children and their brown beetle genes go on to the future so and we've seen this happen over and over again actually one of the reasons um you know is brought a very famous one is the uh pepper moths of england uh before the uh you know industrial revolution of england what happened was there were um uh beetles or not beetles i'm stuck on the beetles excuse me um there were uh, moths these pepper moths and they hung out on birch trees and birch trees of course are black and white and the pepper moths are black and mainly white and so they have the reason they're called pepper moths is because they're white with black speckles all over them but there's also black pepper moths but they're just totally black um and obviously the when they hanging out on a birch tree they get seen and picked off and eaten well yeah what happened is um the industrial revolution happened and pollution 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 got all over all these coal burning plants and it, all the coal ash in the air you know got all over everything including the nice white birch trees and now the nice white birch trees are dirty gray so now we have dirty gray and the black pepper moths can suddenly blend in way better than their white speckled friends and because of that they got selected against and there was way more black pepper moths uh surviving to the next generation with their black pepper moth genes versus the 
uh, white pepper moths that got picked off. And then when we finally, uh, you know, passed a axe to clean up the environment, uh, you saw the return of the uh, white pepper moths again, because, you know, we were cleaning up the environment. Yeah, hi, Monty. Anyway, so. So there is heredity where uh, this is, you know, and this is where he had a kind of a uh, underwear no moment. If you remember from South Park, uh, it was kind of like, what was it? It was steel, you know, underwear, question mark, question mark, question mark, number four, profit. Yeah, Darwin had a hole here because he didn't really know anything about genetics. So he knew there was heredity. He knew there was, you know, things being passed on to the next generation, but he didn't really have much of an understanding of that, which is kind of funny because after he published uh, Gregor Mendel published. And if he had been reading it, he would have gone, oh, wait, I think this guy's got it. So it's kind of funny that Darwin and Gregor Mendel were alive at the same time and um, <laughs> didn't know each other. If only they had gotten together. Oh, well. So anyway, so he had a hole here, which is like, well, how does it get passed on from generation to generation? And Darwin was like, oh, uh, and he actually unfortunately made stuff up, which led to a very dark chapter in science. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so basically the surviving brown beetles have brown baby beetles. And because this trait moves on in the generations, you see less and less green. The end result is that the more advantageous the trait, in this case, the brown coloration of these beetles, which allows the beetles to have more offspring. Therefore, it's more common in the population and you don't see as many green beetles. And this process uh, eventually all individuals in the population will end up being brown. And like I said, it can go back the other way depending on what's selecting. Like we, we uh, like I mentioned with the industrial revolution, making all the birch trees nasty, uh, which let the, uh, you know, the darker pepper moths uh, hide better and they're, they're what used to be the more normal uh, white pepper moss, you know, get picked off. And then it went back after we cleaned up the environment. So it's an interesting thing. You can actually see it happening. But Darwin didn't think it happened uh, that quickly. He thought it happened insanely slowly, crazy slow. Because again, he was working off um, a lot of the newer concepts that were coming up in geology at the time that, you know, it takes a long time to see a lot of changes in, in, um, in geology, which is true. And he thought maybe if it worked for geology, it definitely would work for biology. So, which is eh, kind of, we'll get there in a minute. So, kind of. So anyway, he wrote this huge book and, um, this is this is basically what you can boil that book down to. Unfortunately, a lot of people tried to wade through his book and misinterpreted a lot of it. And unfortunately, one of those people uh, later was the Nazis. And this is where we go into dark science, because I like to point out dark science traits. And that is the Nazis read a lot of his stuff, but didn't quite understand it. Uh, there was a lot of... Hmm, quack doctors among them that gained notoriety and um, unfortunately they came up with the thing of um, eugenics which is well if you know survival of the fittest which is also a misnomer um, and um, you know we could breed better humans and unfortunately you can still find eugenics laws on the books here in the United States um North Carolina a few years back just finally finally got those laws off the books so for a while before World War II the eugenics movement was using um you know natural selection to say hey we can breed smarter better humans so how about we not let degenerates breed and it's like a we're not dogs b it takes a minute and see, that's just not how we humans like to work, you know? I mean, you love who you love. So it was disturbing. And um, they would actually forcibly take anybody they considered a degenerate 
and forcibly sterilize it. And this meant people with mental health issues. This meant people with any type of disability. And I do mean any type of disability. They would, uh, families would forcibly get them. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, the Nazis took it even farther with the concentration camps because they thought, hey, if we can just get rid of, then we can make the superior Aryan race. And it's like, oh God, no. No, 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 no. Um, unfortunately, that's, like I said, eugenics is a very dark, dark topic in biology. And unfortunately, it stems out of misunderstandings of Darwin's work. And it's something I bring up because I don't want to see ever history repeat itself. And that's something, you know, you always need to look at the uh, history behind a lot of um, science, where it came from, where it's going and um, how we can use, you know, proper ethics to steer it. And this was definitely, eugenics was a fail. There was no ethics happening, right, Monty? Yep, no, no, there was no ethics. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, and there's still eugenics laws on the books in, in states today. And it's been rough. Uh, they've been forgotten for the most part, but they really need to be, you know, pulled out and repealed, all of them. It's disgusting. Uh, so yeah, it's and there's a lot of sad stories. Uh, there's you know a lot of people that didn't know what was going on, had their families bring them somewhere, and had themselves forcibly sterilized, and now they're sitting there going, "Oh, thanks." And um, you know, in this day and age, we wouldn't consider whatever they were going through a disability, but back then, didn't want those traits passed on, so they decided to take it into their own hands to breed better humans. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But, yeah, so that's why I bring it up. Disturbing facts. Anyway, so moving on. So as mentioned, um, they didn't have de uh, they didn't have genetics. They didn't understand that step. It was it was natural selection. Okay, what's heredity? So there was people like Lamarack, uh, Jean Baptiste Lamarack, the guy I mentioned that uh, tried to figure it out by uh, cutting rat tails off rats. Uh, yeah, it basically he he wanted to figure out how heredity worked, and he used rats, and unfortunately it didn't work because a mammal genetics are a lot more confusing and not a good starting spot. It, we're lucky. Gregor Mendel worked all this out with plants because plant genetics is pretty easy. Mammal genetics, complicated. Yeah. So um, long story short, you know, he, he sat there and thought that whatever happened to you in this life, uh, your baby would have it too. So for instance, I've, I've been actually uh, bitten by a bobcat. I have a scar right here. And um, that happened before I gave birth to my son. If we were under Lamarack's thought that um, my son should have the same mark on this arm uh, from what happened to me. But that's not how it works. We know that today. We know it's like if somebody says that, you'd probably be like, what? But um, so, yeah, long story short, uh, he basically took these rats and expected them so he chopped their tails off and bred them and expected to get a bunch of uh, tailless babies. And he was very surprised when he didn't. And he was like, that's weird. And, um, and again, yeah, was that ethical to do that to the rats? Nobody cared back then, unfortunately. So long story short, yeah, that was not great. So, um, but he still, he wrote papers going, well, this didn't work, which is a sign of a good scientist it's a sign of somebody sitting there going yeah well this didn't work so i need to tell everybody else so they don't do it too um you know owning up to one's uh failures is how we learn so anyway so over the next few decades scientists integrated genetics and this became known as the modern synthesis the coherent understanding <laughs> of the relationship between natural selection and genetics. And we put it together to become the theory of evolution we know today. So, and it basically took shape in the 1940s. And like I said, it was a long, hard, difficult birth that the Nazis screwed up. So, thanks. Anyway, so 
I meant that sarcastically. So anyway, so this can basically affect, as natural selection can affect the pop, uh, population's genetic makeup, in return, this actually creates populations of species, which is called speciation. Now, there are actually also pulling together two things, microevolution, and macroevolution. So what we just talked about with natural selection is a type of microevolution. It's survival through the inheritance of favorable characteristics. In other words, things that make it easier for you to live. Like if you're living in a cold climate, uh, more fur and more fat on your body. So that way you don't die of exposure. Um, or if you're living in a desert, definitely less fat and less fur so you don't die of exposure um so mutations uh selection natural selection is in here um now macro uh, macro evolution and monty's getting but come on dude help me out here man anyway so macro evolution is the progression of biodiversity through geological time so this is where speciation happens over time and like i said darwin used to think this was very slow and we have been found out since then it's not that's there's some parts that yeah are slow and some parts that are not slow we've actually found um we've actually watched speciation happen within the lifetime of a married couple that went and studied darwin's finches uh, for six months of the year, every year, on um, on the Galapagos Islands, so it was actually, and they they watched it twice, happened twice while they were studying these finches, uh, that new species of finch would arise, and um, documented very very well. So you know, when people sit there and say, "Yeah, it's not a thing," it's like, no, we've we've seen it. It's <laughs> we've seen it, and documented it several times. It's a thing. It's been documented, seen with eyeballs many people anyway and extinction extinction is also a part of macro evolution um which is why we have birds and not dinosaurs you know not sure which is better sometimes so because i want a pet triceratops but that's just me all right so let's define what a species is so a species is a group of individual organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile, viable offspring. Now, um, example of this is domestic dogs. They can interbreed and make offspring that are fertile. Um, in other words, you know, like one of my dogs was a Heinz 52, which is, you know, a term for, yeah, we don't know what, what breed of dog it is. It's kind of a little bit of everything. Like, you know, she was like part, I swear to God, she was she definitely had lab and German shepherd and she had something else too. So she, cause you could see the German shepherd markings in the ears and you can see the labness in the nose, but um, there were some other things thrown in too, which always was an interesting speculation day among my family when we were sitting outside with the doggies. Um, however, there are, you know, things, species, for instance, mules. Well, horses and donkeys can breed, uh, we get mules and they're infertile. They cannot make their own species. To get more mules, we actually have to take more horses and donkeys to make more mules. So they're, uh, which means, you know, they're a separate species and they can still interbreed. Now you can do this with some of the big cats too, but um, it takes a bit of genetic manipulation because to make a liger, it's a male lion and a female tiger. And I'm gonna tell you this right now has been uh, you know, a former zookeeper that's worked with tigers. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't. The, the, the first thing when they see each other is not, you know, way, hey, hey, it is, uh, I'm gonna kill you. So uh, to make ligers and such, we've had to genetically, you know, take the uh, sperm and eggs of lions and tigers and in a lab, put them together and then put them into a uh, surrogate mother to come to gestation. So, yeah, <laughs> did not work. Not that great. Oh, well. So yeah, ligers just don't come from, you know, throwing lions into t and then with tigers. They don't particularly care. And again, ligers are infertile and big. They are way bigger than both lions and tigers, which coming up with an even bigger cat is actually its own problem too. 
as they eat a lot and they want to play and you're kind of squishy and they don't exactly attack they just kind of break you because they don't realize their own strength when they're playing i know because that's how a tiger at the zoo stole my pants yeah one day i was you know we had one of those uh, we had a tiger kitten and by kitten he was the size of a large dog at the time i think he was six months eight months maybe anyway he wasn't full size yet so we could actually walk him around on a harness for a bit um you know it's 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 it was interesting so i was like i'll take him out on the harness so i took him out on the harness and there was nobody in the zoo that day it was when the zoo was closed we were closed on sundays uh you know even cats need even animals need time off so anyway, um, we were walking him around and I was putting him back and he decided to wrestle. So he grabbed my leg and he went one way with my pants and I went the other way without my pants and I had no pants. So that is how the tiger took my pants. Anyway, fun facts. So speciation. So how do new species arise from one foundation species? So there's a ton of different ways, but we basically split it up into two very broad categories. There's allopatric speciation, which is basically what Darwin kind of figured was happening, um, which basically means that a similar uh, uh, one species gets split by geographic such, uh, separation to form new species. So that way they can't interbreed with each other. So say there's an earthquake and, you know, one species of rabbits um, have to, you know, leave and another species of rabbits have to stay. Um, so what happens is, you know, the ones that leave get pushed into a colder climate to survive while the ones that, you know, get forced in another direction go to a warmer climate. And you'll see changes like, you know, the, the ones in the colder climate will slowly over time, those develop, you know, thicker fur, more body fat, they'll be chunkier. Um, they, they gather a lot more food. Uh, whereas down in the, you know, in the warmer climate, those, those uh, rabbits will have uh, thinner coats. Uh, and like, for instance, you see uh, near the desert uh, rabbits or you know, desert hares, they have those huge ears that are very thin. And that's actually for, uh, to get uh, uh, heat. It's uh, actually a, a heat loss mechanism where you, you'll see very small ears on winter rabbits because again, what's going on is they're trying to conserve heat. So they don't want to lose all that heat through their big floppy, through their big ears. Whereas the, the uh, you know, ones in the uh, warmer climates have big ears to try and lose that heat so they don't overheat um and that's allopatric speciation so it takes a long time to do that uh, there's also different variations of allopatric speciation where for instance if something forces one species to become one half of it become nocturnal and the other half become diurnal and half i mean you know a group I don't mean like instantaneously 50% does this thing. No, no, no. I'm just throwing numbers out there. Um, so what happens is, uh, yeah, because they can't, even though it's not geographic, it's time-based because they don't, you know, they're not awake at the same time. They're not going to breed, you know, the nocturnal ones are always going to breed with the ones that are, you know, nocturnal along with them. And the diurnal ones are not going to, uh, breed with the, uh, nocturnal ones because they're awake during the day and they're like looking over at those guys going they're so lazy they sleep all day um and that would be an example of sympatric speciation which means they're in the same area as their parent species remaining in one location and we've seen this sympatric speciation over and over again um we didn't think you know it, it, it took us a while but then we figured that out because we actually watched it in several instances, including that married couple that went to the Galapagos Islands. They literally saw this one um, uh, finch come over to one of the islands that they were studying just the finches on that island. And he came over from another island, uh, landed one of the finches, you know, mate from one of the finches on, um, you know, that island. And they started breeding and making their own different split out species and then all of a sudden a drought went through 
and reduced um, that one species down to just a handful of individuals. Um, because of that, it split out within four generations as a completely different finch, had different songs than the other finches on the on the uh, thing uh, island. Excuse me. Uh, it had uh, you know it had uh, different uh, habits of eating. Um, it was a completely different species, and it wasn't even interested in the other two finch species anymore at all. So it became a brand new species uh, just through you know on the same island just through, you know, uh, environmental pressures. So it was actually, so we've seen it again. We've seen it. We've documented it several different times now. So it happens. All right. So a couple of things with owl Patrick. So you've got dispersal when a few members move to a new geographic location. This can happen any which way, uh, natural disasters, uh, ice ages did, <laughs> does, does a good job of that um heat waves uh anything that makes the forces a uh, group of uh, species out of its its original zone into new zones is is basically what you're getting with dispersal uh vicariance this is basically when uh natural uh situation arises to physically divide like um going from uh you know diurnal to nocturnal so you know there's the diurnal birds and the nocturnal birds and they don't see each other because they're up at different times of the day so they're not going to breed with each other and yeah and then there's adaptive radiation so many adaptations evolved from a single point like the islands of the archipelagos because there was a founder species of these finches and then it split over time so that way they could fill these individual niches um on the island like you know one group just you know wanted to eat seeds another group just you know went after bugs so that way they weren't competing with each other and we're going to talk more about competition and stuff like that uh, closer to the end of the semester when we talk about ecology because this is where the bigger picture of ecology kind of comes in and we start touching that um so yeah you know, at different different environmental factors to let everybody survive on the island, so that way your offspring have a better chance to survive into the future. So more offspring, more of your genetics goes into the future. So yeah, biology is really all about sex, but the boring parts. It's all about getting your genes into the future. So anyway. All right, so St. Patrick. So anyway, so we talked about the genetics and sometimes you get non-disjunction during meiosis. So remember that, remember DNA is sticky and sometimes you get two uh, chromosomes that fail to separate during the uh, different times of uh, mitosis. So mitosis one, mitosis two, sometimes be, during that the, it doesn't separate. So we get things like too few chromosomes called aneuploidy and too many that have polyploidy. Now polyploidy can also give rise to reproductive isolation. And you go, but what about aneuploidy? Doesn't it do the same? A lot of the times aneuploidy doesn't rise, <laughs> rise to anything because if you don't have enough chromosomes, you aren't going to get any offspring. It's just an automatic dud. Nothing happens. The, uh, the sperm and the egg meet, and because it doesn't have enough uh, the chromosomes to start, it just sits there and goes, uh, and then it gets flushed out of the system. So that's it's a it's a non-starter. It doesn't go if you don't have the amount of chromosomes you need to you know propagate. It won't go. The the egg and the sperm just kind of meld and go. Uh, and, and then it leaves them and it gets kicked out of the mother's body so anyway polyploidy does arise we we have it i mean um if you remember from last semester um especially if for those of you that were in my night class we talked about things like you know um trisomy 21 um which is down syndrome um but not all of you know polyploidies are bad uh especially in plants uh plants seem to love being polyploidy mammals it messes us up a bit but not all the time so you get these things anyway so there's auto polyploidy which is having double the chromosomes means it can only mate with itself to res uh, give rise to a new species so therefore like i said with the aneuploidy if you don't have uh the same amount of chromosomes to start you know the fertilization process proper like to start turning into a fetus and then start turning into an offspring um 
that's what happens with autoploidy is like you've got an extra and she's got an extra and oh baby now you can because you both have matching you can have enough to make your next species so offspring to start turning into the next generation of this possible new species alloploidy is when two species combine with two generations to create fertile offspring so two separate species come together to create fertile offspring which is a new uh it becomes a new species so um and like I said, we were talking about that kind of with those two finches that we saw. One one finch comes from another group of species from another island, hops over and finds a mate with a different species of finch. Somehow he attracted one of them and she was just like, ah, oh, hey, you're different. And um, luckily they had, you know, enough to start, you know, a uh, hybrid offspring. And then uh, over a couple generations down the road, that drought happened and all that was left was those uh, offsprings from that hybrid uh, mating that occurred. So that's uh, allo polyploidy. Now, another way is through reproductive isolation. This is where divergent characteristics affect a species to interbreed and create. And there's a whole bunch of different types of this. <laughs> There's a prezygotic barrier, which is basically, again, that means before the egg and the sperm can meet, or, you know, the way hey, hey can happen, uh, the prezygotic is usually get like the night and the day birds you know you know if one if the same species one's awake at night the other ones they can't get together because they're never awake at the same time so they're not going to have sex it's so yeah they can exist in the same place but for some reason some variation some change makes it so even though they're all in the same spot they're never going to have sex with each other and they start diverging uh post-zygotic is like for instance mules uh, for instance, uh, the two, you know, horses and donkeys get together, they have mules, but they're, they're not fertile. So therefore you can never have mules, um, as their own species. They're just not, they're just donkey horse hybrids. That's it. Uh, we've tried to do the same thing with zebras. FYI, zebras are just mean all the way around. We've tried to domesticate zebras. Yeah, that did not work. Zebras did not go for that. Zebras said, uh, no, they're, they're, they're wicked. I mean, you know, donkeys have a temperament. Yeah. Uh, turn, dial that up to 11 and that's a zebra anyway. Um, <laughs> and we've tried, we've tried to breed, uh, zebras with horses, uh, and we got zebra horses. I forget what we call those. Zebra horses, I don't know. Horse zebras. Or something, and I'm not thinking of it right now. Um, I wish there was somebody in here with me that could yell at me. Um, anyway, so long story short, yeah, it just yeah. So post psychotic is afterwards. Um, this is also when, for instance, um sometimes the babies just can't happen. Like, for instance, uh, a wolf hound and a chihuahua could have kids. But they're not gonna because number one, they've got a prezygotic, which because you know the wolfhound and the the chihuahua are going. Yeah, I don't know how this is gonna. I'm huge and you're tiny, and then if there was ever you know a way to get past that part, you know naturally, I mean you could probably do it, you know, artificial insemination. Um, but the, the postzygotic is like if the chihuahua was the mommy, the puppies would be way too big for her and they'd kill her. Uh, that's another postzygotic. Sometimes the uh, resulting offspring of the hybrid is too huge for the mother to bear and will kill the mother um, way before childbirth because it just gets too dang big. Uh, there's temporal isolation. That was the time one on the night and the day. Habitat isolation. Yeah, and again, they migrate off to a different habitat. Behavioral isolation. So you see this kind of like with birds. Uh, for instance, this is why they're beautiful. And, and they have these insane dances because, you know, somebody comes up with a new dance move and all the females and some of the females go, whoa. And now we've got one group that does a certain dance move and another group that does a certain dance move that, you know, they find sexy. And, and because of this, you'll get, you know, uh, speciation that way. There's the gametic barrier. Again, if you don't have enough, uh, you know, the... <laughs> there okay, here we go back into dark science again so <laughs> during um 
let's see here during the uh time of the communists and the rise of communism in um what became the soviet union uh it was interesting because there was a scientist who stepped forward and said and i can't, I can't think of his name off the top of my head but he sat there and he said i want to make a hybrid human um uh ape uh hybrids and this is definitely a gametic barrier thing and can i get my laser point there's my laser pointer so it's a, a gametic barrier because he did he actually got uh russian women to sign up for this only a couple though <laughs> and he thought he could take uh the sperm from chimpanzees and put them into human ovulating human women and get them to have a human chimp baby did not work thank god did not work because he, he misunderstood a lot of different things that goes on between how sperm and egg come together and there's a lot of things that the um like i'm sorry chimpanzee sperm cannot it's like they don't know what to do with each other so the sperm's looking for you know a chimpanzee egg because that's what it's drawn to and it just passes the doesn't even bother with the human egg so it's like wah human eggs just like oh that was weird <laughs> so anyway so they don't even it doesn't even go it's 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 like um i had another one when i was at the zoo uh people used to come up to me all the time and tell me that uh venomous snakes were mating with uh, uh non-venomous black snakes and making venomous black snakes and i'm sitting there going no they can't it's like you know a bird uh mating with uh, uh, a frog it's it's they don't care you know um if i throw a venomous snake in with a non-venomous snake they just kind of stare at each other like monty's staring at us going unless it's a king snake and a copperhead king snakes will uh, which is a non-venomous um always will eat venomous and um and <laughs> so the co uh, poor copperhead sitting there going hi and the king snake's like mm, dinner so <laughs> again they're not gonna have sex so that so some of these are you know a lot of in between a lot of them are more than one um fun fact cotton mouths will eat copperheads too we found that out at the zoo fast but hard way anyway hybrid uh and viability again we make hybrids like mules and ligers but they can't make any babies so there you go and habitat influence um again there could be shifts in the habitat due to weather or geological fun and you know pompeii go boom and birds get thrown everywhere because they survived humans not so much so anyway there you go so population genetics, um, all of these factors come together to form the basis of the study of population genetics. And we're gonna get into that a little bit, um, is how selective forces change a population through changes in allele and ge uh, genotypic frequencies. So we have the allele frequency or gene frequency is the rate at which a specific allele appears within a population and the gene pool, which is the sum of all alleles in a population. So like take Hendersonville here, if we took the, you know, genetic, uh, you know, we just did some DNA, you know, that 23 and me tests, um, then yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, that's basic, we, you know, did all the alleles that are all the people living in Hendersonville. Uh, that's our June pool. That's all the different genes that could happen between, you know, matings between all of us peeps hanging out in Hendersonville. And some alleles will appear more than other alleles. And that's, you know, gene frequency. And that's the rate at which a specific allele appears within a population. Like, for instance, there's going to be a whole lot more people with brown eyes because that's just a lot of people have brown eyes. So there's going to be a whole lot more of us brown eyed people than there are going to be blue eyed people and green eyed people. And keep in mind, you know, color with Color, eye color is very much a sliding scale like i've got hazel eyes technically so but i'd lump myself in with the brown eyed population more than just go yeah house hazels are different that's like splitting hairs at this point anyway so that's basically where we come up with things like this genetic drift now this is where this survival of the fittest uh actually arose from and, and really got a little bit more cemented but unfortunately it's not really 
healthier it's whoever's lucky um genetic drift is basically some individuals uh leave behind more descendants and they're thus their genes than others for instance this guy right here is walking around and he just happens to just step on a bunch of you know beetles and kills off all uh, some of these green beetles suddenly there's you know and it isn't because they were green it was just because they happened to be in the way that day um you know it's it's uh so it's not necessarily somebody who's better it's just somebody who was not stepped on that day um or like for instance there's some of us that you know just uh, get a lot more uh chances at uh you know making the babies like genghis khan genghis khan by far biologically speaking is the most reproductively uh winner of the human race because heck, uh, most I think it's like up to like ninety percent of Mongolia can trace their direct ancestry back to Genghis Khan. He was prolific, and his sons were prolific because they had multiple wives. Um, so his genetics, wee. so that's why his genetics are out there in the population more than anybody else at the moment, and. So, yeah, uh, so Genghis Khan, when it comes to, you know, getting your genetics out there, he just, it wasn't because he was like, you know, I mean, he it was, he was good and he acquired a bunch of wives and then he died of um, drinking himself to death. Good going. But then again, if you have that many wives and that many sons fighting over your position, I, I, I could understand that, I guess. So anyway, he just, you know. He could have gotten, you know, killed by an arrow in a in a battle when he was young, and then he ne ne never would have happened. So yeah, it's genetic drift is not necessarily the better individuals; it's the luckier individuals that get to, uh, you know, have more kids out in the future. So anyway, so that in a nutshell is genetic drift, and it happens to all populations all the time, and there's no avoiding it. Like, for instance, you know, I mentioned Pompeii a little bit earlier. Uh, Pompeii is definitely something like that because Pompeii, you know, they were war kind of warned. You know, they're looking up going, gosh, you know, the mountain's getting awfully angry lately. And like some people got out of Dodge because they kind of looked up and said, you know, I don't like the way that mountain looks. I'm going to go hit the next ship out of here. And then the majority of the people hung back and said, oh, it'll, it'll, it'll calm down famous last words in latin uh, it'll calm down anyway and you know pompeii went and all those people died and uh you know in a horrifying way there's nothing like having your lungs atomized in your own body yay uh so yeah that's that's basically you know what happened an entire population got wiped out because of one volcano going and like I said, nobody was expecting it. Uh, it's just something that happened. You know, random acts of nature and other crazy things like that. So that that's a bunch of people that 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 uh, gene pool did not go on into the future. So there's also something called genetic bottleneck. Now, this is happening right now with cheetahs. And um, this is something we're trying to help so that way we don't lose cheetahs because this is what's happening. So this is when a population is greatly reduced in size, limiting genetic diversity. So unfortunately, this is where inbreeding is going up because there's not a lot of people left that aren't related to each other. And this is definitely helping with cheetahs, uh, or not helping with cheetahs, excuse me. This is what's happening to cheetahs. Cheetahs, there is kind of like a turf war in Africa in the fact that... Uh, lions and hyenas are like gangs if you take the crypts and the bloods except it's lions and hyenas and i'm not kidding you i, I kind of equate it to uh gang warfare because these animals will go out of their way to kill each other for no reason whatsoever you know none of the usual it's like oh you're fighting over food okay that's normal no these guys if like a black hyenas just happen to see a lone a uh, lioness hunting they will deviate from whatever they were doing even if they had a more pressing thing on the time we have seen them change direction go over and just go kill that lioness you know really get rid of the competition and same thing with packs of lions they'll they'll come up on a hyena just tear it to pieces they were doing something else they didn't care they deviated went over and killed that hyena unfortunately this has been going on a long time now 
So it's 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 the, like the epic nature gang war. Um, but the problem is the one creature that's been caught in between that doesn't really have a very good foothold are cheetahs. Uh, cheetahs, you know, have also you know been stressed out from loss of uh, habitat, just like lions and hyenas. However, they also don't act like lions and hyenas. They're very singular. They don't um, work in packs like lions and hyenas do. And, you know, their bursts of speed are not for forever. So they're, they're very much different. And because of this, unfortunately, lions and hyenas will pick on cheetahs. Uh, because they're alone, they're never in a pack. Uh, it's more likely they'll be taken down by a pack of lions or a pack of hyenas because they're competition. Um, and unfortunately, also because poaching, hunting, all this fun stuff, their population has gone down, 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 down. And it's gotten to the point where they're actually quite a very inbred species, which is not good because remember inbreeding increases a lot of um, uh, recessive genetics that aren't always very good. Uh, just take it from the uh, families of the ancient Egyptian royalty. I mean, Tutankhamun uh, was not very healthy. <laughs> we did like a lot of things. He like, he had like, a gazillion canes buried with him because the 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 man could barely stand. Uh, that's how messed up his spine was. But anyway, so yeah, it's not great. So we've been trying to. So that's called a population bottleneck, where we had oh uh, you know a big species that had lots and lots of genetic variation, and then something major happened to wipe nothing but a couple of individuals out, and because of that, they lost a lot of their genes in their gene pool and because of that they're all very related and that's not great because that you know you get a lot of problems popping up genetic you know heredity problems things that are passed on down the line genetically speaking so gene flow this is also known as basically migration so it's the movement of genes from one population to another and this happens all the time um it even happens in us humans so let's take you know um hurricane katrina and what happened a lot of people got forced out in the worst way of Louisiana and relocated with their families all over the place, all over the United States. There's several that, you know, moved up here and they never went back. Um, and same thing, a lot of, a lot went into Texas. And again, they did a lot of went back, but not everybody did. And because of that, it brought, you know, new, uh, gene flow into texas and north carolina and you know that was predominantly hanging out if you want to see humans in this kind of perspective so it happens all the time i mean you know wars displace people and all of a sudden you get a whole group you know moving over to the united states because we're the land of opportunity which i find cool and you know we we get waves i mean that's actually why there's uh a lot of vietnamese in the area as well uh because um you know Oh, quite a few came over here uh, after the Vietnam War and yeah, just, you know, set up little things. It's like, like New York City, we've got Chinatown, we've got, you know, out in uh, San Francisco, they've got a whole Japanese area. I mean, it's, it's, this happens all the time, e even in humans, it happens all the time. So, but this is a good thing, genetically speaking, because they're bringing different genes and it adds to our genetic uniqueness. And that's a good thing. And it makes us more healthy as a population. So gene flow happens a lot. Um, and it's basically just migration, but genetically speaking. So some other examples, we've got mutation. Some mutations are unfavorable and they're quickly eliminated from the population. Um, you know, something you know, doesn't really help. Um, now, others can be beneficial. Uh, so if it's beneficial or harmful, that determines if it helps it survive to sexual maturity and reproduce. If it does, and if it's something they can pass down to their children, Awesome. If it's not, then it doesn't really matter. It didn't, you know, it's just a, a genetic drop in the bucket. So and then we've got non-random mating versus a sort of mating. So basically, uh, again, this is why peacocks have those gorgeous tails because, um, you know, the females would go, oh, look at that tail. Oh, that is just, mm, I want to have his eggs. <laughs> So, you know, so they would mate more and more for bigger, bigger, better, shinier tails. And um, that's why peacocks have the amazing tails that they do. So the peahens walk up and go, hey, I like your tail. Anyway, so 
that's why peacocks have this gorgeous coloring and uh peahens are just like mud brown because they have to hide with the eggs <laughs> so anyway and then they make weird calls like cats anyway so environmental variants so this is like people from cities are usually fair-skinned and more rural areas you know it's why they call us southerners rednecks because you know we've been out in the sun so our, our necks got really really tan and uh yeah whereas you know if you live up in the city new york city um you know you get outside but not like you do out in the country you know there is a so so again there's different ways this can force things so the one we've actually been talking about the most um how we force uh you know populations back and forth is directional selection so directional selection is uh what i talked about back with the moths and the uh the green and brown beetles the examples back at the beginning of this lecture so what happened was we have directional selection and that we do one extreme or the other there's nothing in the middle so in other words you know with the uh the brown and the green beetles is the example i gave earlier um the you know the green beetles uh got selected against because they were easily picked out while there was more and more brown beetles so it shifted the uh selection uh from green both green and brown and medium here and it shifted it to like one side if you put it into a graph and same thing um you know it can shift back with directional selection so you know like with the moths it was the pepper moths it was like the white speckly moths survived the best on the bark of the clean um birch trees whereas after the industrial revolution the uh dark pepper moths survived better because the whites were seen by the birds and picked off and eaten before they could have babies and it, and back when and then we you know came up with maybe we should clean this up and we cleaned it up and the birch trees are back to being clean again it shifted back so directional shifts from one extreme to the other extreme stabilizing selection uh basically is against both extremes and keeps it right in the middle we actually show this with human births um we uh do way better when babies are around an average size so that way they can get out of us moms uh <laughs> although then we came then then we came up definitely and you know had the cesarean section which helped a lot so we could do bigger babies but it selected against the smaller babies that were born because they were weaker and they couldn't survive you know they, they'd get more hit with prone to getting diseases and stuff like that and and um uh, a childbirth rate before the modern age was just insane you know you do you had a lot of kids back then not because you needed a lot of kids you had a lot of kids back then because they didn't all live to adulthood um uh, so you know so tiny babies you know didn't survive as much to adulthood to you know spread on genes whereas medium-sized babies did and huge babies um before cesarean sections would kill the mother in childbirth so there was you know that's why childbirth is no walk in the park even in this day and age it's no walk in the park uh i know i went through it it was no walk in the park um anyway so um that's why you know we have an average size baby that that comes out of us humans and that's why it's it's and although it's shifting now uh towards the bigger babies because we have a cesarean uh, uh you know uh, yeah you know what i'm talking about all right so that's what's going on with um the stabilizing selection then you've got disruptive selection where it basically selects us against the medium but it it goes for both extremes and this is this it's rare really odd to see but we have found um this one was kind of like well if we got this and we've got this then we should have this it was kind of like one of those things and for the longest time we really didn't have um a really good um example of this in the wild that was observed and we finally hit it and we were finally like oh and it was a shrimp that was getting um uh, killed off by a virus 
And the shrimp went one of two ways. One became very tiny and very resistant to the virus. And it split, whereas the other part got very, very big, but made a ton of babies. So that way they'd get killed off by the viruses a lot, but they'd have so much of a population that uh, it didn't matter. So the virus, so this is like virus led disruptive selection. So we have seen this. It's just kind of rare compared to these two. We see these two the most, especially directional, but we see these two the most in nature and this one, not as much, but we have found examples of this with shrimp. And that brings me to the end of this um, discussion. So, things I'd like to share with you real quick, if I can share. Yes, I am screen sharing. Let us share another screen. No, that's not what I want. How do I escape? Oh, that's not it. Forgive me. Nope, wait. It. it. Now let me go up and see if I can get into. Okay, there we go. So I wanted to show you on the thing here, uh, when I open it up, um, I'll give you the time, basically what's going on. Here's the intro, enjoy the meme. Eggs came first. Um, anyway, the lecture will go right here. Um, here's the notes to go with it. Your lab for t uh, this week is a short one. It's uh, the taxonic tree of life. It's uh, 20 minutes. And then you'll have uh, two crash course videos uh, on natural selection and speciation. I wanna add a third, but we'll see how that goes. So a third might pop in or not, I'm not sure. Um, and that's what you're gonna do. And one, uh, uh, the weekly quiz, which I'm gonna pop up after I upload this video. So keep in mind, we went over three chapters, uh, really rapid succession. So uh, last week we went over chapter 22 and now I just hit chapter 23, 24 and 25, in one blow. So like always, if you have any questions or anything, um, I did see a lot of uh, you know questions and everything. Always feel free to message me. Uh, again, sorry I'm late this week. Um, I'm next week. I'm not going to let it happen because I'll see you on Monday, so I can get more stuff done. Okie dokie. With that said, if you've got any questions or anything like that, you know, just message me on Remind or you know email me or message me through uh, this thing. So with that said, goodbye for now. Have a great weekend. Take care of yourself and bye-bye. Say bye-bye, Monty. He's like, what? He goes, oh, hi. No way. <laughs> and you can always come by. Remember, I'm always here Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in uh, Lab 223 in Patton Building uh, from 1 to 245. So if you need some, come on down. Or you can come on and meet Monty, whose head keeps disappearing. <laughs> Monty, did you know your head keeps disappearing? Shocking. All right. Have a good one. Bye.